We are on a back-to-back, no load management here on the NBA Big Board Podcast. Me and Richard Stamen are back for another episode. In this episode, we are going to cover the top prospects from today's games in the Sweet 16. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And the clip god himself, Richard Stamen, a.k.a. Mr. Mavs Draft, is back again. Like I said, this is a back-to-back. No load management over here. Sore throat and all. We just got to keep on going. (laughs) So... All right, let's talk about the Sweet 16, which takes place today. In the first game, it's Michigan State versus Kansas State. Now, this is a game that I don't think will feature any first-rounders. It could be a game that possibly does not have anyone drafted at all. But who is your number one prospect in this game? Far and away, Keontae Johnson. He was somebody who, if you're not familiar with his story, he was at Florida until this year. And he also had a very notable, he went in, I can't remember exactly what the situation was, but I know he collapsed against Florida State. That was the last time we'd seen him play basketball. Or actually, no, he played like two games last year. And then he transferred to Kansas State. Knock on wood, been completely healthy. He's been re- great. He's returned to form in terms of play. Personally, I have him in my top 40. He's six six, has ridiculously long arms. He can shoot. He can score at all three levels and he defends. And he's got one of, if not the very best, first steps, I think, of non-guards in the whole draft, too. So I'm big on him. He's somebody who, when you look at the fact that he'll be 24 during his rookie season, yes, I hear what I'm saying, plus the health red flags. He's somebody, if you just look at the talent, why is this guy not considered at at minimum a late second rounder? Yeah, I mean, I think the medicals is going to be huge. But here's what surprised me. He had a difficult time getting by Jacob Toppin in the Kentucky game. I was actually surprised with the fact that he just could not get by him. Did you have a chance to to watch that game and see a little bit of that? I watched it. I honestly did not notice that. Maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention. Could have also been a big, you know, thing about Jacob Toppin. I like him personally. So I'm using my blind optimism and saying, hey, maybe that says something more about Toppin than Keontae. Blind optimism. That's a definitely a word I'm going to add to my vocabulary. But no, it was a couple of plays where I just felt like it was late in the shot clock and he was trying to drive by and he just wasn't able to turn the corner, which was actually surprising to me. And then I thought he would be able to like use his shoulders and, and, and bully his way into a spot, but he he struggled with it a little bit. But 17 points, seven rebounds a game. He averaged two assists, shot 50% from the floor, 40% from three on paper. The numbers look good. Let's talk about the age thing for a second, right? I do think we, as evaluators or people in this draft space and the media, we do place a heavy emphasis on age. We kind of frown up on it when you are older than 22. Sometimes it's even 21, right? And um, Chuck Cooperstein for for the Mavs, the, the guy that does the Mavs game, he's, he's an old school guy, and he absolutely is totally against – holding age against players. He's like, if you can play, you can play. And on one hand, the flip side of having a prospect that is older is, and I, and I mentioned this about Keegan Murray a few days ago, is if you're an NBA team, you're going to get a guy that is close to his prime on a rookie deal. That makes the most sense financially. It, it's, you're not spending a bunch of time trying to develop a guy i mean of course there's going to be a learning curve for for any rookie but if you can get a guy that's going to be 20 i mean if you have him the whole time you could end up having him until you're 30 on a mac uh, on a rookie deal or you know the the first couple years will be on a rookie deal i mean that's a lot of bang for your buck do you think that there is a team out there that will look at it that way and say, Hey, this guy's talented. And and of course, if everything medically clears, do you think there's a team out there that will be smart enough to look at the bang for their buck that they'd be getting if they drafted a Keontae Johnson? 
I don't know how many teams are going to draft Keontae Johnson. He's somebody who I'd gamble on being just this undrafted free agent, but I really do think teams will look at him. Again, just the production, the eye test scouting report says this guy should be drafted. And then you look at why he is still playing college basketball at the age. And that's a, that's quite a clear, not excuse, but it just real background. Like it's a real reason as to why he's not your normal 24 year old. And I think yeah. teams will look at him that way. Now, again, like you said, it completely depends on the medicals. We've seen Jared Butler is somebody who I think slid because of the medicals. Obviously, he's struggled to latch on, so maybe not all the medicals. And he also he had a heart condition. It could be something where, you know, if, if he's cleared, you might see him taken in the 50s. And again, as we talked about on Wednesday, there's two less picks in this draft. So the odds are less this year than most years to be drafted. Yep. What are your thoughts on Marquise Nolo? Man, for a 5'8 guy, he's all defense in the Big 12, he was, which is remarkable. I, I don't care what way you are playing defense. Doing that at that size is ridiculous. I love his shooting. Uh, Kansas State and these undersized guards as shooters is really fun. Last year they had Nigel Pack. Now they got Marquise Noel. I think he's really good, and he comes in with a chip on his shoulder. NBA guy, probably not just because, I mean, there's only, what, three guys, I think, that are under six foot in the league right now or that are at least playing real minutes. It's hard. And the majority of the guys, I saw a stat, the majority of the guys under six one are on two ways. Here's something yeah. I saw. So I, I know if you look at the box score, you saw that Casey Wallace was like nine of ten from the floor, but he could not get by Marquise Noel. Straight up. Like, he needed a screen or he had to, like, he could beat him off the dribble. I put it like that. I mean, he was, like, chest to chest. He beat him on the spot. I think Noel is going to be someone that agents are going to run from in the pre-draft process. You do not want your client getting schooled by a 5'8 guard and getting locked up by a 5'8 guard in a one-on-one, two-on-two, or three-on-three situation. It just does not make sense, especially if he's not, like, on draft boards and he's not, like, a top 60 guy. That's the last thing you want as, as an agent, for, especially for your 18- or 19-year-old freshman going against this experience <laughs> guy that is small that already has this extra chip on his shoulder. I mean, he's going to be picking up full court at the combine, I think guys are going to run from him because you have too much to lose. What are your thoughts on Naquan Tomlin? I I will be 100% honest. I really don't – I haven't considered him as an NBA guy yet, so I haven't really dove into him. I think he's a good college player, but um, I don't have many thoughts, if any, about him scaling up. What about you? Sleeper. He's raw. He's 22, I believe. Just started playing basketball recently. Has a very small resume. Shows flashes of potential. He's definitely a guy that I think should enter this year. And I think he's good enough to get a two-way. And I think that he should develop in, in the G League. I mean, at his size, I think he's like 6'10". The way he moves, has some incredible blocks in the Kentucky game, could be a lob threat. Show some flashes of ball handling. He's from New York City. So, you know, if you're from New York, you know how to dribble the ball a little bit. There are flashes that are there. And on top of the fact that, like I said, he's still raw because of his lack of experience, I think a team should really take a good look at him to develop him long term. The first person that comes to mind, and it's, you know, it's not the sexiest name, but it's Dwayne Dedman. And Dwayne is a friend of mine. They're totally different players, but Dwayne's first basketball game, period, was after high school. He grew up a Jehovah Witness, wasn't allowed to play basketball, so he was raw. Like, he he wasn't even, like, playing street ball, and he went to JUCO for a couple years, went to USC, was still raw, bounced around in the league for a little bit. And I, I, I want to say I'd have to ask him. I think this is year 10. The last time I talked to him, he had been playing in the NBA more years than he had been playing basketball prior to the NBA. How often does that happen? So he had only played like four years of organized basketball. 
And if he's already if he's on year ten, then he's been playing the NBA <laughs> double the years that he's. I mean that's that's unique. So that's the situation with with uh with Naquan that I think is a possibility. All right, when we return, I'll ask Richard his opinions on prospects from Michigan State. If there is anybody from Michigan State that he thinks is an NBA prospect, stay tuned. If you've ever dreamed about becoming an NBA GM and managing your own franchise, well, your dreams have come true. You can manage every strategic aspect of your team. You can play through the season and lead your team to glory. And you get to be responsible for hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and training players, making draft picks, and navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs that come with the season. All of this is in a challenging and realistic game. The Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and it is playable offline. And you can play on the go and you can play as much as you want to. All you have to do is go to the App Store, download the game, probasketballgm.com, scan the code or look it up in the App Store. That is probasketballgm.com. And you, as a locked on listener, will get a 100% free boost to your franchise when you use the promo code locked on in the game store. So make sure you check it out. That is the Ultimate Basketball GM. So start your dynasty today. All right, second segment, we left off talking about Kansas State. Now let's talk about Michigan State. Now, for me personally, and I don't want to offend anyone from the state of Michigan or any Michigan State fans, but if there's one school that is like considered a blue blood school that their prospects just seem to bore me, it is Michigan State. And I'm saying this, which is weird, when I'm a huge Draymond Green fan and Zach Randolph is one of my favorite two players ever and both of those guys are Michigan State guys but Michigan State just doesn't produce like these guys that are like I mean they they all have like this toughness about like you got to be tough as nails to play for Izzo but they don't produce a bunch of guys that are like top 10 picks or guys that are like sexy prospects that that um, really pop out to you on film is there anybody on this Michigan State team that you believe has a chance of being an NBA player? Maybe Joey Hauser. I mean, 6'9 shooting. And also his brother has been really, I, I think, given the role he's been playing in Boston, I really like what Sam Hauser has been. I think Joey's going to get a chance. You look at, just for those who don't know his stats, so he's a fifth-year senior. He started out at Marquette. Him and Sam were actually teammates there. He went to Michigan State, redshirted, uh, this is before the entire transfer game changed. That was the COVID right before COVID. Um, this year now, 14 points a game, seven rebounds, just about two assists a game. And that's on 48.5% shooting, a career best, and an absurd 46% from three on five attempts a game with 88% from the line. So, like, the shot is very real. The bloodline suggests the shot is very real. He's probably your best case. And given that he's 6'9, I think there's a good chance that he, uh, He could be somebody who sticks as a shooter off the bench. One name I've been hearing is someone that that is like looking for sleepers believes that Malik Hall has a chance of finding his way into an NBA roster soon. The case for him was 6'8", 220, moves his feet, didn't shoot the ball as well from three as he did last year, but shot 87% from the foul line. And the guy was telling me with that size, the body, the potential to defend multiple positions, if he can knock down open shots, they believe that he has a chance. But the concern is he shot 42% from three last year, but only 69% from the foul line. This year it was 34% from three, but 87% from the foul line. But the, the person that I was talking to who was like really like digging for sleepers believes that he has a chance if the shooting ends up um, improving. All right, let's talk about the next game, unless there was anybody else from Michigan State. Do you think um, um, Jaden Akins has a chance? He's another guy where the talent, he's, he's talented, but I just, I don't know if you can justify it. I, I think he needs another year. I think give him, I'm not, the book's not out on him. He's averaging just under 10 points a game. As a sophomore, I just don't think that's enough. I think give him one year, let him, you know, I think Tyson Walker's out of eligibility. I can't remember. 
see how he does transitioning off of him maybe next year. He's not a guy for this year, I don't think. All right, next game, FAU versus Tennessee. Best prospects in this game. I think it's Julian Phillips. I'm, I'm like 99% sure. Uh, I do think Elijah Martin is underrated out of Florida Atlantic. The only problem with him is he's 6'2". Uh, kind of like we talked about earlier, just height matters so much. Granted, he's built like a, I mean, he's, he's built like a linebacker. Like he is absolutely jacked. I don't know if you got to see him when you went to conference USA too, but I mean, even last year when I saw him, I was blown away. And this year is the same thing. I didn't get a chance to go. The game I tried to go to, they played, somebody played UNT. And of all the games, the UNT game was sold out. <laughs> but every yeah, other game, was, yeah, it, it was empty. John L. Davis, have you had a chance to, to, to watch him? I couldn't tell you much about him, if anything. Um, I do know that he is the number one scorer on the team, but I haven't like scouted for him. 6'4", 200 pounds, has this toughness that comes from being born and raised in Gary, Indiana. Average like 14 points, five rebounds. But the shooting splits are great. 50, 39, 85. I did have someone, and this wasn't like a, a scout or anything like that. It's just someone that watches basketball, felt like this guy has a chance to be an NBA player. He loved his size and the toughness and the competitiveness, but that's the name that I'll, I'll keep an eye out for. He strikes me as a guy, even though the team was 33-3 and three and they're winning, but he strikes me as someone that some of these big blue blood schools are going to be <laughs> trying to see if he is available and wants to come play for you know, a, a bigger school in a Power 5 conference. Now, as far as Julian Phillips, I've been hearing so many different things. Oh, man, I've heard that he's not happy with the way he's been played or used at Tennessee. I've heard that he's for sure coming out. I heard that if he does come back to school next year, it possibly won't be Tennessee. I've I've just heard so many different things. Every scout that I've talked to is like, he does not need to come out this year. He needs to return to school. And he'll have a much better opportunity considering the 2024 class isn't thought to be as strong with all the guys from Tennessee leaving. He has a chance to really stand out there. But people are saying that he just wasn't happy with his role. And I remember before the season, I talked to to somebody and they mentioned that he is on a veteran team. And they don't need him to win. They don't need him to come in and average 10, 15 points per game. If he averages six points a game or nine or whatever, they felt like Tennessee was going to be good anyway. What are your thoughts on him overall? Yeah, I, I personally like him. I think he's a still a key part of why Tennessee has the number one defense in the country. He, he's just absolutely sound on that end. Plus, he has a great motor, and he has a nose for the ball. And I, I personally think if he's not – coming out next year he shouldn't return to school he should go to the g league ignite and go from there we've seen fa abagidi did that granted he got hurt so like not exactly much of a case study to go off of there but he's somebody who i could see benefiting from that i'm a believer that he should come out this year i think he's a guy where not exactly josh primo where you're gambling on hey he's going to take that jump next year let it be in the nba and with us but like that's the same kind of thing as Josh Primo, just not to that extent that Primo was gambled on. I think for me, the big thing is, yeah, he's shooting 25% from three. I get it. Small volume. I'm taking the the sample size of 82% from the free throw line on four attempts a game. It's a very real sample, 118 attempts. I'm taking that and going, all right, this guy can definitely shoot. Like there's real touch. It's a win, not if for him. And and I'd want to be the team to to get him early and have him under control for eight plus years. The new NBA scouting <laughs> where guys can be drafted high on potential despite not having crazy production. Now, the thing that you mentioned that I haven't heard is him joining the ignite. I That's never thought about that. Yeah, no, you're right. I've never thought of it from that perspective, even though I spoke to somebody and it was a scout and he, he was still like, undecided on how to evaluate the ignite and he he mentioned that and i mean you you live in dallas and he said jaden hardy is the biggest example of why it's tough to evaluate the ignite he was a 
high volume, inefficient score last year with the Ignite, but he mentioned that he looks like he's more prepared than the majority of the rookies, period. And he's talking about his production and the stats, and then, you know, it's like 29 points, 50, 40, 90, or something like that in the G League the time he did play. So the, the, the scout mentioned, like, even though it cost him a lot of money and he fell so far in the draft, he's like, he was prepared. That was the best way for him to get prepared. But then he also mentioned that because he fell so low in the draft, that that could be a reason why Jason Kidd doesn't fully trust him. Because if he were a top 10 pick, then you probably feel like you got to play him. <laughs> and so, but the guy mentioned, like there are some teams that just are really having a difficult time evaluating the ignite. But what they mentioned about Hardy, which could be beneficial for a guy like Julian Phillips is that, the guys from the Ignite in the 2022 draft that went higher than Hardy were defensive guys. He talked about Dyson Daniels and he talked about Bochamp. So he's like, even if you can't score for the Ignite, but if you can defend to show that you can defend, you will get drafted in the first round. So I started out to say this. I never thought about the Julian Phillips going to the Ignite situation, but it makes sense. And that's why we have you on because you offer different perspectives that that really do make a lot of sense. All right, when we return, we'll talk about the last two games that probably have the best NBA prospects in them. That is UCLA versus Gonzaga and the big one, Arkansas versus UConn. Let's talk about FanDuel because it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. Because if you're a new customer, you get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. So just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes drain. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So do not miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA and Locked On. All right, wrapping up this segment, we got to save the best for last. And let's start off with UConn and Arkansas. This is the game that has the most NBA prospects. From an NBA scout vision or mindset, what exactly do you want to see in this game? Man, we talked about it yesterday on on the show. Jordan Walsh versus Jordan Hawkins. The the battle of Jordan uh, is going to be outstanding. I think we've talked about how Nick Smith and Anthony Black have kind of struggled so far. But Jordan Walsh has really made a name for himself. And Jordan Hawkins had an explosive game against St. Mary's. I'm interested to see how Jordan Hawkins does. And I think personally, this is a game where scouts will go, all right, if he has a good game, He's shooting up boards. If he has a bad game and Jordan Walsh doesn't let him get anywhere, this could be something where it's like, all right, maybe the shooting is very real, but will he able to translate that up to the next level? And I think that's going to cause some questions if that happens. Yeah, if, if I'm UConn's coach, I'm looking at how Arkansas defended Grady Dick and I had absolutely no airspace. And I'm trying to think of a game plan to find creative ways to get Hawkins some open looks because Arkansas has some defenders between Anthony Black and Ricky Council and, and and Jordan Walsh that can really cause fits. What I'm looking forward to seeing is how Donovan Klingen plays. And if he plays a lot, he's one of my favorite prospects in 2023, even though I think he's going to be a 2024 guy. I think long-term he needs to follow the Kessler Walker route and transfer. And I know UConn fans are not going to be happy with that. But I imagine Sanago is coming back. And if he comes back, then, I mean, if you play him and Klingon together on the floor, I don't think that's going to be, like, the best, you know, as far as their team, team-wise. team But why well, I say it's similar is because, uh, man, I get his name. Walker Kessler. Did I say Kessler Walker last time? I get it mixed up. Walker Kessler was behind Armando Baycott at Carolina, didn't play much, transfers to Auburn, and has a, like, 
crazy dominant year blocking shots, like a historic year in a sense, goes to the NBA draft. He's a first round pick, and now he's going to be first team All NBA. I think Klingon has a chance to follow a similar path. I don't know if he's going to be able to get 25 minutes per game at UConn if he returns to school, if, you know, Sanago returns. But in a limited role, especially for an Arkansas team that does not have great shooting and they rely on guys getting to the basket, I think Klingon could have some big minutes where he's blocking shots and altering things. I mean, it's like 7'2", 265. So that is a match that I'm looking forward to seeing. Of course, seeing if Nick Smith can bounce back. I think it's very <laughs> beneficial for his draft stock for him to, to bounce back. If you had to choose between Nick Smith or Andre Jackson having a good game, a big game, who would you choose? Man, at this rate, it's got to be Andre Jackson. Andre Jackson is somebody who – he is, he is like college basketball's Josh Green is the best way to describe him. He's energetic. He's like a Tasmanian devil in just so many ways. He's a crazy passer in a, in a good way. Doesn't score a lot, though. Um, so I I think it's going to be Andre Jackson. He just impacts the game in so many ways. You know, I saw someone I compare him to, and it's not a knock, right? So whoever made the comparison, if you're listening, don't get mad at me. And if you are an Andre Jackson fan, don't get mad at me. But someone compared him to like a – Poor man's version of Ben Simmons. As far as being able to rebound, push the break, kind of impact the game without really scoring and not having a, a jump shot. I haven't seen the numbers. I know the numbers were good last year, but I didn't believe in them. And I think they were bad this year. Last time I looked, unless he, you know, got hot towards the end of the season. The jump shot is kind of funky looking. And that is kind of concerned about whether or not it goes in. And I'm not a big Ben Simmons guy, but I'm an Andre Jackson guy. I like Andre Jackson. But I can see it in in, in a small package of him coming in the NBA, coming off the bench, and playing like this role where he just changes the tempo with his speed and athleticism and, and being able to pass the ball ahead. But I think he'd struggle in the half court. Yeah, and Andre Jackson, those numbers are that you referred to, I mean, just pulling up from Synergy, 25% from three on 56 attempts from catch and shoot is alarming. Off the dribble, he's 10 of 30, so 33%. The jump shot is just such a question mark that I, I don't know if I buy into it. And again, just that combination of low volume and just lack of jump shooting, and he's shooting 65% from the free throw line, there's a lot of red flags about it. He's a really fun player, and I think he's somebody who is going to do well in workouts because he can probably shoot fine enough in a private, you know, just drills. But in game, I just I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. Yeah, what was interesting about his stats from last season was he was actually somewhat efficient shooting off the dribble, which to me is an absolute miracle that he's able to get a shot off off the dribble considering how how weird and many mechanics and <laughs> it, it just just how weird his form looks but it's weird it was a low volume his freshman year shot 90 percent from the foul line 71 as a sophomore 65 as a junior 11 percent from three as a freshman 36 percent last year which was not bad and then 28 this year but he rebounds he passes the ball ahead he's a good athlete he's the one that i would take a chance on I would definitely take a chance on as a change of pace utility guy that can come off the bench and, and, and um, you know, just kind of impact winning and, and losing. Is there anybody else in this game from a scouting perspective? What about Sanago? Do you think he's a. He's, he's an interesting. He's another guy. Does his top, does his play style translate? I have wrong, a hard time. Wrong that. era guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, Donovan Quinn is a guy who I think he's just so impactful at the rim on both ends where I'd rather invest in him as the big man on Connecticut. Even though Sanago is 17 of 48 from three this year, which is 35%. It, <laughs> you don't believe in it. it. It's just not enough. I mean, he needs more sample size. He needs to prove, honestly, like he's somebody who maybe another year would help because if he comes a full stretch five and doubles that volume, it might, and he does well, that would make his stock skyrocket despite his age. 
at that yeah, point. Yeah, and I, I think it's a possibility. I mean, we're talking about a guy that attempted one three-point shot his first two years, then had a mini Brook Lopez moment where he goes from not shooting threes at all to all of a sudden he's shooting over one a game, shot 35%, nearly 80% from the foul line. So <laughs> there's a a pretty decent showing that he really improved on his touch. And so he's definitely someone that I think should test the waters and he could be someone that, that shoots really well at the combine, but stylistically, you know, it just seemed like his game is more suited for the, the old NBA. What have your thoughts been about Anthony black so far? He man in the tournament, it's been a little bit, less than I would have liked, but on the season, it feels a little bit inconsistent where, you know, he had a great Maui invitational dropped a couple duds right before uh, the, the conference play started. It's been mostly good in conference play. And then again, just kind of falling down a little bit towards this postseason. He had a really good opener against Auburn in the conference tournament and then nine points against A&M four points against Kansas. But the thing with him is he still finds a way to impact the game. He's getting six rebounds. He's getting six of steel, uh, excuse me, six assists <laughs> so often where he's still impacting the game in a positive way. Yeah, he's five for 18 so far in the NCAA tournament. But like you said, he's impacting games. But man, they're going to need more than four points from him to win. And it, it, it's, it's just weird to think about it. Arkansas won against Kansas with Nick Smith and Anthony Black, two of their highly touted McDonald's All-Americans combining for just four points. If you're Kansas, you have to be just kicking yourself that you you went out that way. All right, UCLA versus Gonzaga. Who was the top prospect that you were looking to to see in that game? That is one of the hardest questions, I think, of any of the Sweet 16 games, who number one is. Because right now, I think, uh, if you had asked me a week ago, it's Jaime Jaquez. But Amari Bailey has just been playing so well since conference tournaments, and he's a freshman. He's always going to kind of leapfrog, give him the benefit of the doubt. But I think it's one of those two guys on UCLA, as good as Drew Timmy is. I absolutely, and I'll be honest, absolutely hated Amari Bailey's game in high school. I thought it was just pure selfishness, tough shots, drove it out of plan, was like a highlight hunter. I just did not like his game at all. And I was on record of saying that. And now I have turned the corner. I'm going to do an article about players that I was wrong on. And he is probably number one because I didn't think that he would do as well as he's done. I think at the beginning of the year, he still kind of showed flashes of the selfishness and and so on. But lately, I think he has 12 assists in NCAA tournament. He has proven me wrong. He has done an excellent job of buying in to what UCLA has, the role that UCLA has wanted him to play. I have to give him credit for that. And I think he's really made a name for himself amongst NBA scouts with his play over the last half of the season. So Amari Bailey is someone that I'm looking forward to seeing against Gonzaga. Adem Bona against Drew Timmy, that is the matchup that I'm going to be focused on. I mean, Drew, (laughs) Drew is Drew. Drew is known for for getting buckets. I mean, even when guys defend well, like I thought Michael Peavy did a good job on him. I thought Evan Mobley did a good job on him a couple of years back, and he still was able to get his. Baylor probably was the, the national championship game, was probably the best I've seen the team defend him. I've seen him cook Texas, where he went like 15 of 19 from the floor. But Adem Bona proposes a, a challenge for him. He's strong, maybe around the same size, but just a – freak athletically has the physical tools that that um you look for as far as like a just the energy guy off the bench that can come in and be a stopper but that's the matchup i'm looking for what about you like who do you think wins that matchup yeah don't forget adam bona is unfortunately he's listed as day-to-day so he may not play that's going to be a massive difference maker he played the last game right yeah it's just I, I would give him the benefit of the doubt. He's had a week yeah. off, like or almost a week off. He's going to have time and it's the NCAA tournament. But in case it doesn't happen, that would be a real bummer. But I think I, I think Drew Timmy is just so good in college right now that I think he would win. Now, that being said, I think he would be slowed down a lot, but I don't expect him to play every minute a Dembona's out there. So, you know, 
running up the score a little bit when he when Bona's out is going to be big for him. And uh, but when they're playing out there, I, I think Adem Bona is going to get a lot of good matchups versus him. I can see it going either way. I can see Bona giving him some some fits, but I could also see Drew getting him in foul trouble in the first few possessions with his head fakes and. And Drew is a guy that really makes shot blockers pay because he'll use their aggressiveness against them, get him in the air, lean into him. And so I'm looking forward to that matchup. That might be outside of whoever is guarding Jordan Hawkins, whether it's Jordan Walsh or Vicky Counts or Anthony Black. Adem Bona and Drew Timmy is a matchup I'm looking forward to seeing. All right, Jaime Hawkins. I don't know if we've talked about him at length. What are your thoughts on him? He he is one of the most divisive prospects in this class. Some people like him. Some people just think, like, there's no way his game translates to the NBA because he's not going to be featured in the NBA and be able to get the ball in, like, the mid post and be able to operate. What are your thoughts on him? And do you think that he could change some of the narratives about him or, or convince some of the doubters if UCLA makes a championship run? Yeah, I mean, UCLA making a championship run would be wild given, I mean, they're missing Jalen Clark. I think it would say a lot about Jaime Jaquez, and he's got a chance to really make that narrative possible. For me, I've done a 180 on him. I think if you'd ask me any of the last two years, I'm like, okay, this guy's clearly bound for Europe. His play style doesn't really fit the modern NBA. But the more I watch him, the more I think, hey, maybe like because he can do so many different things. He's a power forward who runs the pick and roll. He can shoot. He's not much of a defender. But he can score down low. He has a post game. He can do all these different things. And his feel for the game is incredible. That's what allows him to do all of this. He runs offense. He can pass a little bit. I am curious if maybe just finding that role, like if he can just find a role, one of those things will stick. Again, feel for the game, guys. I mean, those are guys I think really worth investing in. These guys who just, they understand what to do and when to do it on the court. I'm about investing in those guys. So I've done a little bit of, of a 180 on him. Yeah, we're going to watch two of the craftiest players in the last four years compete for a chance to go to the Elite Eight. So Timmy and Hawkins is going to be a game of like old school, crafty, low post scoring with footwork, head fakes, and and just I mean, craftiness. Is this, that's the best word that comes to mind. So I'm looking forward to that game. Who do you think wins? I, I think it's going to be Gonzaga. So I've got one name we haven't talked about. I think it's going to be a big difference maker, and that's Julian Strother. I think yeah. if he has a big game from three, it's over for UCLA. And and he's where you're going to start missing Jalen Clark, I think, more than the last two games. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about that. And he definitely opens things up for Timmy. If if Gonzaga can, can make some open shots and kind of, um, I guess, spread the floor, now you're leaving Timmy one-on-one. And he's arguably the toughest matchup in the country under single coverage. Well, that wraps up this episode. We did a back-to-back. Hopefully everyone has enjoyed the last two episodes. And thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, you have to check out Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow Game to Game on the Locked On NBA channel. It is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Richard Stamen. We just broke down today's games, and we will be back. Well, I'll be back tomorrow. Richard may have stuff to do. But I'll be back tomorrow to break down Friday's games. Hopefully everyone has a great day, and we are out.